Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day that you have given to us, a day that you have made. And we certainly give you thanks and praise for your ancient words, which are indeed living words. And you have said that your word is a two-edged sword. And so, Father, we just pray now that the words of my mouth, the words that you have given to me, and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. We're shifting today. You know, we had started 1 Thessalonians, but we didn't really get out of chapter 1, maybe even chapter 1, verse 1. Um, it's a good letter. It has much to teach us. But I have been pondering lately how I might better prepare you folks, the people I serve, for a future in which everything that can be shaken will be shaken and is already being shaken. I mean, last week, uh, Friday, I was asked, well, how many volcanoes are um, erupting? And I said 41. Well, at the time, I was wrong. It was 40. By Tuesday, it was 41, and today it's 42. So a lot of things are happening in the world. And last week, when I read the excerpt from Tom Doyle's book, Standing in the Fire, Sammy, the main character there, uh, an evangelist to Muslims was with his wife, and you know they were scheduled to meet three couples who wanted to give their life to Jesus Christ. And um, without hesitation, they did that. They'd been having dreams about Jesus. But before they were even able to have the prayer of commitment, before they could say amen, gunfire, you know, filled the house, was spraying the house, was raining down upon them. Um, already wanting to, you know, these people wanting to kill them for their faith in Jesus Christ. And in the midst of the gunfire, Sammy spoke out scripture passages of God's promise. And I wondered, would I have done that? I honestly don't know. But it got me to thinking about God's promises. Our God is a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. I have said that many, many times, but how many of God's promises do we actually know? I would venture to guess that uh, most of us don't actually know that many of them. Okay? Considering there are more than 3,000 of them in the Bible. Do you know 3,000? I don't know 3,000. <laughs> And, uh, and so I certainly don't know them by memory. And of course, I mean, God didn't go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three thousand. Okay, no, he didn't do that. They are in the text and in context and so forth. So uh, if we don't know them, how can they help us, much less help other people? Okay. You know, we are living in extraordinary times. We know that the day of Jesus' return is getting closer and closer and closer. Um, so it really would be good for us to get to know God's promises because we never know when we or somebody else might need them. So this week I went to the bookstore, Barnes & Noble, because I didn't find this at Mardell, so... Okay, Barnes and Noble. Found, I looked for an hour <laughs> because I went there looking for one book, which of course wasn't shelved where it was supposed to be shelved. So I looked up and down and looked it up and then looked more. I probably went around all those shelves about six times and finally found the book I was looking for. It is God's Promises for Life for Teens. <laughs> the Ultimate Handbook for Your Every Need. Now, I have gone online, and they've changed the cover and put God's promises for life for women, God's promises for life for men, and so forth. They just changed the cover. I think, I'm pretty sure the insides are still the same. But this is the one I found, and this is the one I bought, and what basically it is is a book with 2,100 Bible passages. 
arranged in 144 different topics. Promises of God arranged in alphabetical order. That, of course, makes it really simple to go for referencing. And uh, I really would like to read to you a, a portion. Well, it's an edited portion of the introduction. The introduction is fairly lengthy. Um, but it's a really good introduction. I just really appreciated it. And, uh, and so, yes, I've edited it. But really, it gives us an idea as to God's promises. You know? And who our God is. So anyway, what I, it, it says under the heading, How to Use This Book of God's Promises, the publisher writes, <clears throat> There is a wonderfully rich hymn that should be the anthem of every Christian. The refrain goes like this, Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, stand, I'm standing on the promises of God. We were going to be singing that this week before I even bought the book. They were reading my mind in advance when they published this book. Anyway, it's the kind of song that you sing at the top of your lungs when you're faced with an eviction notice or a pink slip, when you get that unexpected phone call or unwanted medical report. The, the person who wrote it is Russell K. Carter. It was written in 1886. It's been around a while. His song is rooted in the encouraging promises from God's word that reminds us, the earth and sky will wear out and fade away before one word I speak loses its power or fails to accomplish its purpose. What a wonderful promise, one of many that God has spoken over our life. I mean, did we know that there are hundreds of similar guarantees from God for one of our needs, every one of them? From fears to forgiveness, provision to protection, security and God's ultimate salvation through his son, these promises don't change and they are always true. They are for all people, for all time, because they reflect the character of God and his ultimate purpose. The all-embracing blessing and flourishing of the world in and through Jesus Christ. In the center of all God's promises is the Hebrew word barit. The word that is translated in the English covenant. It's one of the Bible's most important themes and crucial for unlocking numerous verses that remind us of what our Heavenly Father has personally guaranteed. Covenant is different from contract. Because the intent of a covenant is to form and solidify a relationship. At the heart of covenant is a relationship between God and people. A relationship characterized by faithfulness and true love. Loyal love. While people are anything but faithful and loyal, the promises of the Bible are guaranteed because God, who created them, is faithful and fiercely loyal. The goal of the covenantal relationship God has formed with Abraham first and then Israel and now followers of Jesus Christ is to restore this broken world to the way he originally envisioned it in the beginning before the fall. What this means is that the gospel, God's story of rescue and re, uh, recreation through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is at the heart of God's promises. All God's divine promises have their fulfillment in what the Father did in and through his Son on the cross. Signing a new covenant in Jesus' blood. This everlasting covenant absolutely guarantees God's promises and purposes for our lives both now and in the future. But there are two important questions to ask. Who are God's promises meant for and, and which of his promises still matter today? Are they for those people in the Bible, or can they be for us too? The answer is yes. Throughout the Bible, we see that God gave promises to three groups of people. Individuals like Abraham and David. The nations, usually Israel, although nations in general as well. And every person. Some promises are specific, and some are general. At other times... You know, whether they are, well, 
whether the promises are specific or general, we can draw principles from them. Principles that can help us in our life. So there are three things to consider when we come across a promise in God's word. The first is the context. Everything has a context. God's promises are often found in a larger story. And so that larger story gives us even more information. So the context is everything. I mean, this little book is great. The reason why I like it is it just has the Bible verses. Okay, it just has the Bible verses. And that's, I think, very important to me. Because I can go look up the story. I can go look up the context and everything. And, and these people said it here. He says, you know, they have faith in God's word itself and God's spirit to get the point across to each and every one of us. They didn't have to put it into devotional form for, us, you know, to, for it to be helpful to us. So this is actually what I was looking for. So the first is context. The second is look for the if. Look for the if. Some of God's promises are conditional. Meaning, if you or I do something, then God will do something. Okay? They're not just a blank check all the time. Sometimes they are conditional. I mean, we all know this one. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That's if then. It's a condition. God's people are the ones, not sinners. He's not calling on sinners to humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. He's calling on first Israel and now us in the church to do that. If we do that, then God will do his part. The other thing that we need to look for is seeking God's character in the promise. You know, whether the promise is general or specific to a particular individual or maybe a particular nation, the character principle will help us discern how God's personal assurances are relevant and applicable to our own eye, to our own lives. In the end, and this is just really important, and this is something we don't always recognize. In the end, God's promises aren't about us or our needs. They're about God and his character and his divine purposes. The only reason we can stand on the promises of God at all is because he is fiercely loyal, overly gracious, quick to show compassion, slow to anger, and all loving. It's all about him. So, you know, there, there's a song in The Sound of Music called Do Re Mi. And, it's our, and, and when Maria was teaching the kids, it was like, you know, when you read, you begin with ABC. When you sing, you begin with Do Re Mi. And so this book, of course, is alphabetized. And so the very first uh, entry here is on abandonment. Abandonment. Now keep in mind, the whole idea behind this sermon series is going to be to help equip us to help others, and also ourselves, in times of need. Okay? When things really get bad and the world starts turning to us and asking us questions about why is this happening and, you know, is God for us or, you know, whatever... This is for us to equip us. Remember, my job as pastor is just to equip you for service. So anyway, abandonment, I thought, was absolutely a fantastic topic to start with. Not to mention the fact that it starts on A. But the very first one, and you have these in your bulletin. So the very first one is Exodus 3.12. God is speaking to Moses, and he says, God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. This particular passage 
You know, the context in this one is extremely important. And, and you know, you think about it and go, abandonment. Huh, how do they get abandonment out of this? You know, I don't think Moses was thinking so much about being abandoned, but the people in Egypt were. They'd been for, for almost 400 years, and they were crying out to God for relief. And the text says, and God remembered the covenant he had made with Abraham. Now, God is not forgetful. He doesn't suffer from Alzheimer's or anything like that. But God has a plan and purpose, and he sent his people to Egypt on purpose. There, they actually were able to reproduce and multiply and become a very, very mighty group of people. But Exodus begins that there arose a king in Egypt that did not know Joseph, did not know the history of Egypt or what Joseph had done. And so he started mistreating the people. And uh, then they started crying out to God. And so God then says, it's time. It's time to remove them from that environment. It's time for me to send them to the land that I have promised. Okay? And so Moses is, of course, he's been in the backwoods of, uh, not that they were woods, but um, he's been in Moab for a while. He has, no, he's been in Midian for a while. Anyway, he, um, he's been tending his father-in-law's sheep. And he sees this bush that's burning, but it doesn't burn up. So he goes to investigate. Well, that's where he finds God. Or, you know, God purposed for him to see that bush. And Moses was curious, and then he went and saw it. So, so anyway, what God is trying to tell Moses, he says, I haven't abandoned my people, and I am not going to abandon you. I am going to be with you in the sign that I am with you. You're going to come back after you're, you know, everybody's been released from Egypt. You're going to come back here to this mountain and worship me. So that's, you know, an example of, you know, the context is everything. All right? Then Jeremiah, who wrote Lamentations, in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 31, says, no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Now, if you'll notice on your bulletin, you'll see different kinds of translations, where it's the New Living Translation, or the Message Translation, or the Passion Translation, different kinds of translations. And basically what the publisher did is they, they pulled out the translation that they, they believed fit the text the best. Okay? And so Lamentations 3.31, for no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Can you imagine if a person is feeling abandoned by the Lord, you can say no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. You know, in the scriptures, did, did God turn his back on his people on occasion? Yeah. Because of their sin. Okay? He is not willy-nilly. Because of, his, because of their sin, he would turn his back on them for just a little while. But you know, even in the scriptures it says that God does, you know, God is not angry forever. Maybe two days or three. Which in God's timing feels like a very long time at times. Uh, but 2 Corinthians 4.9 Paul writes, we are hunted down but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but are not destroyed. You'll hear those words in a song we're going to sing too. I traded my sorrows. I'm trading my sorrows. I mean, look at Paul's life. And look at the life now of some of the, you know, the, Christian, the Muslim Christians, not Muslim anymore, but former Muslims, in the Middle East. They're hunted down. But they are never abandoned by God. They get knocked down. They're not destroyed. They just keep coming back. I was reading one of the, actually it was the first book that Tom Doyle wrote. I got it from Carol Last. But that's just the way it worked. Anyway, it was very interesting. There was one story in there that, um, <laughs> oh, this guy, you know, they just kept getting followed by the secret police. 
And so he knew that they, everywhere they go, they was going to be followed by the secret police. And some, one, uh, on this particular occasion, he decided he was going to be proactive instead of reactive. And so he called the, the secret police station. And he asked for the, the guy, the, the agent. And he said, look, we know you're going to be following us today. And it's going to be very, <laughs> it's going to be at least an hour drive. So instead of following us, why don't you just come with us? <laughs> so I know they're not Jewish, but that's chutzpah. <laughs> anyway, so the guy did. Went into the meeting with him. Gave his life to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was like going, oh my gosh. And so, you know, we're hunted down but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Psalm 94 in the Message Bible. How blessed the man you train. In another version it says, the one you chastise. Remember, God chastises. God corrects those whom he loves. How blessed the man you train, God, the woman you instruct in your word, providing a circle of quiet within the clamor of evil. Listen to that. Providing a circle of quiet within the clamor of evil while a jail is being built for the wicked. God will never walk away from his people, never desert his precious people. Rest assured that justice is on its way and every good heart put right. Who stood up for me against the wicked? Who took my side against evil workers? If God hadn't been there for me, I never would have made it. The minute I, say, the minute I said, I'm slipping, I'm falling, your love, God, took hold and held me fast. When I was upset and beside myself, you calmed me down and cheered me up. Um, you know, it's one of, the, one of the reasons why I think the abandonment theme is a really, really, really good one to start with. Um, yes, it's at the beginning of the alphabet. But because of the numbers of people who are abandoned in this life, Children abandoned in this life. What kind of adults do they grow up to to be? You know, this week we heard, you know, we've been hearing the mainstream media clamor to try to get President Trump to change his ways on what's going on down at the border. And, uh, but that led to stories by Border Patrol people of what really is going on down there. You know, the stuff that they don't tell you on mainstream media. And, uh, and one guy, you know, these kids get separated from the adults. Let's call them that for now, instead of parents. Call them the adults for now. And he said, do you know the difference between a parent and a pimp? Some of the kids had been sold by their parents to make the trip so that they could become sex slaves. Their parents abandoned them for some money. How are they going to feel? Their parents have, 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 you know, have sold them into a life of horror. You see, when they come knocking, we're going to have to tell them, God does not abandon you. He never has and he never will. There's a wonderful passage in Isaiah and God's people were complaining to God that he had abandoned them or he had forgotten them. And uh, he'd forgotten all about Zion and he said even if a mother who has nursed you at her breast forgets you, I will not forget you. I have written you on the palm of my hand. God's got us tattooed on the palm of his hand. He is not going to forget us. We've got to be able to tell these kids God does not forget us. How many times have we heard how our prisons are filled with people who grew up in fatherless homes? You know, our school system is filled with kids who don't have two parents at home. 
I mean, the Muslims, they are, they, one of the things that they, they're, you know, that they recite all the time is, you know, uh, Allah is God and, and he has no son. And that goes all the way back to, to Abraham sending Ishmael away. A whole people group felt abandoned by their father. And look at the anger that has produced. And so, you know, it really is important for us to get it into our, our spirits that God does not abandon people. He never has and he never will. So that when, you know, these poor souls come along and they are so hurt by what has happened to them, we can let them know that they have a heavenly father who does not abandon them. The next topic is anxiety. <laughs> Hello? All I had to do was speak the word. And there you are. Anxiety. Nobody suffers from anxiety. Particularly Christians, right? We don't suffer from anxiety. I'm getting these funny looks. From Psalm. 46 verse 10, we know the very beginning of this particular song is um, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, okay? Well, verse 10 says, surrender your anxiety, be silent and stop your striving, and you will see that I am God. I am the God above all the nations, and I will be exalted throughout the whole earth. I mean, we run to and fro. We get frantic about everything. And he says, stop. Stop striving. Be still and know that I am God. Easier said than done. <laughs> oh, so yeah, it's like, it's like being anxious. I mean, Jesus said, does it, does it make one of your hairs black or white? Can you add any inches to your height or anything like that? I mean, the only thing that we can do with our worry, a lot of people eat, so all we can do is add girth to our body. <laughs> and then we have to go buy new clothes, and then we have to go on a diet, and then we worry about that. <laughs> Excuse me. Surrender your anxiety. Be silent and stop your striving, and you will see that I am God. He's got it. He can handle it. Luke, 20 to, Luke 12, 22 to 23, Jesus taught his disciples, say, listen to me, never lay anxiety into your hearts. Never worry about any of your needs, such as food or clothing, for your life is infinitely more than just food or clothing, or the clothing you wear. And then, of course, Matthew 6 from the Sermon on the Mount says basically the same thing. So don't worry, this is Jesus speaking. So don't worry what we will eat or what we will drink, saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear, for the idolaters eagerly seek all these. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He already knows everything. And then from 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety. Other translations say cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for us. You know, uh, another passage coming to mind. You no, know, have no fear, little flock, for your father has chosen to give you the kingdom. So I thought it would be good to look at some of these promises. You can go and buy your own book. You can, you can go online. They have them at Amazon. and I've given you enough information where you can do that. And, uh, but I just think that where we are in history and the nearness of Jesus' return, it may be really important for us to, to have a good grasp on these particular promises because there will be, will be, people who will not have known God or Jesus Christ, his son, 
and they are going to be asking questions. They're going to be wondering, why in the world is this happening in the world? It's real hard to ignore what's happening in the world. I mean, people do it. They just keep going on with their life, but um, with all the shaking that's going to happen, people are going to want answers. And the fact of the matter is, is that none of this should be a surprise to anybody, any Christian. It should not be a surprise to any believer in Jesus Christ because he has warned us and warned us and warned us. He has given us the scenarios. And so we have got to pay attention, but we've got to be prepared to be helpful to other people. And in the process of learning all these promises, we help us too. Assuming which is always an issue, assuming we take to heart what we are going to learn and let it become our food. It's got to become the food that nourishes us. Amen.